375th, and it's, and it's just as exciting to see it again. And I think it's great that you are all um, so involved in the Historical Society. Uh, I hope that new life in the Historical Society continues and grows. I'm amazed at how many people really want to see the document. <laughs> Welcome to uh, your town hall, the Portsmouth Town Hall. Uh, today is our very first inaugural Founders Day for Portsmouth. This is one of those moments, I guess, when you might ask yourself, geez, why didn't we think about doing this, you know, like 300 years earlier? Um, anyway, we're going we're gonna to kick this off with uh, a Pledge of Allegiance. And after we're done, if you'll just please keep your feet for a moment, we'll have a moment of silence for our war fighters in harm's way. So the next, uh, the next thing on the uh, the uh, the agenda is uh, Erilyn Mitchell, our harpist. Thank you for being here. Is going to play the national anthem for us. <laughs> so please, once again, exercise, right? Yeah. Everybody up. <laughs> you but that's a first for me listening to the national anthem on a, on a harp so okay um my name is jim Seventy. i'm the vice president of the town councils I, I was asked to you know say a few remarks and invite every and uh, welcome everybody for being here and all that i'll keep it very short uh first i'd just like to uh, acknowledge my fellow council members that are in the room uh liz pedro sitting back there dave gleason right behind her uh did anybody else sneak in uh, a representative Dan Riley, I saw him. Dan, say hi. Anybody else? Did I miss any anyone? Okay. Um, this really got started. I mean, like I said, you, you might think, geez, we could have thought of this a long time ago. But it really got started uh, with a group of folks that were sort of the, uh, the guiding force behind our 375th anniversary celebration that went on for that whole year in 2013. Um, and they kept at it, kept at it, joined forces with the, uh, with the Historical Society, uh, breathed some new life into that organization, and uh, came to the town council and said, hey, you know, we've got this wonderful history, we've got these wonderful historical documents, you know, certainly the cornerstone sitting right before us with the compact of 1638, 
uh, why don't we make this stuff available so that the townspeople can come and look at it at least once a year? Uh, so we say, hey, what a great idea. So l let me just quickly read the proclamation that started this. It was written by, uh, uh, by the folks from the Historical Society. Um, and we did this uh, uh, December 14th of 2015. Uh, Town of Portsmouth proclamation establishing an annual Portsmouth Founders Day. Whereas the Portsmouth Compact of 1638 is the founding document of our town. And whereas this founding document is physically located in the Rhode Island State Archives, in Providence and requires special handling and arrangement to be brought to, town, to, uh, to Portsmouth. And whereas the Portsmouth Historical Society desires to sponsor an annual public showing of the compact in Portsmouth, of Portsmouth to remind Portsmouth residents of our long and proud history. Now therefore be it resolved that the town council hereby designates March 7th the date of the signing of the compact uh, in 1638 as our annual Portsmouth Founders Day to include a public showing of the compact in Portsmouth on or near that date with the assistance of the town clerk's office to arrange for transportation and temporary storage of the compact in the support of the Portsmouth Historical Society in presenting this document to the public. This was approved by the town council, as I said, on December 14, 2015 and it was signed by Keith Hamilton, our town council president. So let me just take a moment. I, I, I certainly want to thank uh, uh, Tracy Croce, our state archivist, for, uh, for coming down with the document. I believe it came down in a police car, did it not? It did. <laughs> very good, very good, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, that said, what I'd like to do now is uh, uh, al along with all the other festivities that took place in 2013 for our, uh, our, uh, our uh, 375th uh, anniversary celebration, we also anointed a town historian. Now we've had people who have been very interested in history over the years, but this is the first time that I'm aware of that we actually officially asked someone to, uh, to be and act as our town historian, and that fellow is Mr. Jim Garman. Uh, Jim, if you'd like to come up and take over, Jim will give us the real story on what happened. Thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everyone here to this, we hope, the first of a series of Founders Days that we're going to have over the years. The, uh, this is really a special treat to have this piece of paper sitting over here that was signed in March of 1638. 138 years before the Declaration of Independence. Pretty awesome, 378 years ago. I'd also like to thank a lot of friends of mine who helped arrange this with the Historical Society. As <laughs> most of you know, as you're a town residents, I think, for the most part, we did a block mailing to the town uh, in December, and the results were pretty phenomenal. We had, in November, when I took over as president, we had a little, just about 100 members of the Portsmouth Historical Society. We now have about 410, and thanks to you for, for joining. Thank you. And if you haven't joined, there's an envelope out there on the table. You can take one to become a member. What we're trying to do, if there are members here who have not submitted to us your email address, we really would appreciate having that because what we're doing is we're sending out a monthly newsletter of all the things we're doing, and we're doing a lot of things. Uh, and so we want to send that out, and by sending it by email is so much easier. The last time they were sent out, we sent out about 110 or so by snail mail. And so we really would like to have email addresses because the other 300 people got them by email, and that's so much easier, and for obvious reasons, it's so much cheaper. So if you, if you could give us your email addresses, and we promise we won't do any advertising on it, it's just a matter of, of informing you about what we're doing. And again, we're doing a lot. We're here today to celebrate this document that sits over here next to me, and it's a very special document for us and for the history of this town. It's called the Portsmouth Compact. It wasn't called that in 1638 because the town's name wasn't Portsmouth, it was Pocasset. Uh, Pocasset was the Indian name for this area, and Pocasset included the northern part of Portsmouth and part of Tiverton across the river. However, 
this, what is a compact? First of all, a compact is a document which is, it, the, the, the term came along later during the Enlightenment when Jean-Jacques Rousseau talked about a contract social, a social contract. It's an agreement among people to band together for the common good. It's hard for us to understand how remote this area was before the settlers came here. And they were afraid. They were afraid that people were going to scatter and they wouldn't be able to hold the organization together, the, the group together. And so that's why they wrote this compact. It's not unique, it's not original. There was a Mayflower Compact in 1620. When the settlers came there, a little bit off course from trying to land in Virginia, they landed on Cape Cod. And they were concerned about the fact that uh, they didn't have any sort of cohesiveness. And so they wrote a compact, the Mayflower Compact in 1620. And the Mayflower Compact, unlike the Portsmouth Compact, is not around anymore. There are accounts of it, of people who talked about it and said what they thought it said, but the original is not there. We have the original of our document that was written 18 years later. So the precedent, 41 people signed the, the Mayflower Compact, and we have 23 who signed ours. Although that, there's some question about that, I'll bring, get back to it in a minute. The problem that originated this compact was the problem in Massachusetts Bay, Boston in particular. That colony in, in America was what was called a theocracy. A theocracy because it was the church that controlled everything, the Puritan church. It's a little bit ironic because the Puritans, when they came to Massachusetts initially, were coming here in order to escape from persecution in England. Some of them went to the Netherlands for a while, and then they came here. They were being persecuted there, so they came here, and they became the persecutors in Boston. They ex expected everyone to go to church about four times a week. They expected a society that was tightly controlled by the clergy. The clergy was the political as well as the religious leaders. Harvard University, or Harvard College at that point, was established in 1636 as a uh, minister teaching university, college, university later. So it was a very strict society, a society in which it was generally controlled, it was completely controlled by the clergy. The pivotal person, of course, as far as we're concerned, is Anne Hutchinson. And Anne Hutchinson plays a very prominent role in this society that we established here. Unfortunately, however, she didn't get to sign the compact. And of course, the reason for that in those days was the fact that she was a woman. How sad. Uh, but her husband signed it, and a number of her other relatives did as well. She was charged uh, in 1637 with, and, and the main charge that was used against her was called, the titled, traducing the ministers. Traducing the ministers mean criticizing the ministers. What she did was she would have se sessions in her home the day after the uh, church service, uh, like Monday night, and people were invited to come and they would talk about you know, the sermon that had been given the day before, and she gave her own interpretation to that. And some of the very prominent people of Boston came to that. Henry Vane was the governor of Boston for a while, and he was a close friend of hers, and he came. William Coddington, who's very prominent in this whole operation, also the richest man in Boston, he also came. And Anne's husband, by the way, Will Hutchinson, was very well off as well, okay? He wasn't, uh, uh, he was a very prominent uh, merchant in Boston, too. So she was critical of the ministers, and so what they did was they brought her to trial. They brought her to trial in November of 1637, charged with traducing the ministers, among other charges. There were several others, and she essentially stood silent for the most part, but when she talked, they listened and they didn't like what she said. So her punishment after that trial, and it's much more extensive than that, I won't go into all the details, but her punishment was that she was banished from Massachusetts Bay. She was told, get out, we don't want you here. And some of her followers also were banished, and some of them were disarmed. They were told they could not have uh, weapons. So that was part of it as well. Then they didn't want to leave well enough alone. They brought her to trial again, this time before the religious leaders of the colony. 
And this time, she was charged with lying to the clergy. She had had a meeting in October of 1637 and talked somewhat about her beliefs, and they didn't really like what she said, and so she was charged with lying there. And she refused to recant her uh, ideas, and that made it very difficult for the clergy who were running this, and so their punishment for her was excommunication. They forced her to leave the church. She had already been banished from the colony. They banished her in November, but said, you have to be gone by spring. We have to get you out of, out of here, and you can go anywhere you want, but we want you out of here. So then they, because she refused to recant her religious ideas, they uh, excommunicated her as well. So her followers met in, um, in Boston at the home of William Coddington, again, a preeminent merchant there, uh, and probably on March 7th, 1638, there's a great deal of confusion because we have an old style, new style calendar at that time, and we also have another calendar that these people seem to feel was the one we should use. March was considered the first month of the year, and so that's why it says in the compact, uh, the seventh day of the first month, that it was March. We know it was March. Okay. So they, they decided where were they gonna go? And a man by the name of John Clark, the Reverend Dr. John Clark, who had com come to Boston in 1637, and all of a sudden got into this mess of all this confusion and, and you know, hate and discontent that was going on, he said, I'm not gonna stay here. So he and a few other people went out in search of a place to go. They checked out Long Island, they checked out New Jersey, what later became all these, by the way, Long Island, New Jersey, and Delaware. And they didn't really particularly, weren't particularly fond of any of them. Then they got a hold of Roger Williams. Roger Williams had been banished as well as a minister, Puritan minister, in 1636. And Roger Williams had founded a settlement in Providence at that time, 1636. So that was the first settlement in the state, in, what, in the colony, what became the state. So Roger Williams was in contact with these people, and they decided that what they would do was to explore, see where they could go, and Williams was very anxious to give them two opportunities. One was uh, a place that then was called Soams, which is, as far as we can tell, parts of Barrington. And the other, Barrington and, I can't remember, Swansea or Seekonk, anyway, across the, the stream there. And the other was a Quidnick Island, this one. And so what happened was they decided that the Soams settlement wasn't going to work because part of it was still in Massachusetts. And the one thing they wanted to do was get the hell out of Massachusetts Bay. They didn't want to be there. So they talked to Roger Williams. He er, got along very well with the Narragansett Indians. And Roger Williams brought them, some of them down, to talk to the Indians, to talk over it in what is now Narragansett, uh, Narragansett, Rhode Island, talk to them about the possibility of purchasing this island. And so, but before they did that, on the 7th, they signed the compact. And, you can read it up here, I'll read it to you, it only takes a minute, uh, but uh, it's a little hard to read on the original. The seventh day of the first month, 1638, we whose names are underwritten do here solemnly in the presence of Jehovah incorporate ourselves into a body politic as he shall help will submit our persons, lives, and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, and to all those perfect and most absolute laws of his given in his holy word of truth to be guided and judged thereby. One of the things that's interesting in that is there's no mention of a British monarch, okay? Nothing, no, no political influence. This is an organization that's gonna be created to be governed by God's laws. The concept, the, the phrase body politic is also in the Mayflower Compact. And what it is, is an organization where they band it together for their common good. And that's what it means. So that was the compact that they, they wrote on the 7th of March in Boston, probably at um, uh, William Coddington's house, probably written by the Reverend Dr. John Clark. He was both a minister and a physician. And it might also possibly have been written by William Aspinwall. There's some question about that. But there are religious references on the right-hand side of the compact that you'll look at if you want to look at that. Um, would probably make it more likely that John Clark uh, wrote it. 
So the compact was written, and it was signed at that point by 23 people. 23 names are on the compact, okay? Before they came to Portsmouth, or Pocasset, they decided that William Coddington should be, have the title of what was called magistrate. And magistrate, and another term that was used for the same thing, is judge. He was the leader of the colony. He was, the, in, in effect, the political leader of the colony. And again, he was a very wealthy man. So William Coddington, John Clark signs it second, William Hutchinson signs it third, and William Hutchinson was the husband of Anne Hutchinson. And also signing the compact were John Sanford, who was Anne Hutchinson's son-in-law, Thomas Savage, who was also a son-in-law of Anne Hutchinson, and Edward Hutchinson Sr., who was Will Hutchinson's brother. It's kind of a family document in a lot of ways, okay? So they decided where were they gonna go? Roger Williams said, I think we can work this out where we can purchase this island of Quidneck. The Indian name was a Quidneck, N-E-K-E, Quidneck uh, Island. So on the 24th of March, these people worked fast, by the way. The 24th of March, a group led by Roger Williams went to Narragansett and met with three different Indians, all of which names are very familiar to us. The chief sachem was Wanamatonomy. Okay. His associates in charge of this island, more or less, were Canonicus and Miantonomi. Okay, all those names still around in all sorts of different geographical references. They, Roger Williams got along very well with the Narragansett Indians because he didn't impose on them. He didn't force them to move. He didn't, you know, in later generations, the, 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 and the term that was used then, the savages went on the war path. Okay, in 1675, there was a major war fought around here, King Philip's War. Uh, and the, sit the town of settlement of Swansea was burned to the ground. And there was a big fight over in the great uh, swamp in South Kingstown. Anyway, at this time, they were all got along pretty well. And so they decided what, a pr what would be a good price. And the price that they settled on was 40 fathoms of white beads, 10 rakes, and 20 hoes, garden hoes, okay? And the Indians were satisfied with that, primarily because of Roger Williams' uh, influence. So they did purchase it. Roger Williams signed the, the treaty. Uh, Randall Holden, who is the last name on the, one of the last names on the uh, compact signature, also signed it. On their way back from the Narragansetts, they uh, went by a little island out in the middle of the, the bay. And William Dyer said, I want that island. And for whatever reason, it tends to sort of flood in high tides and so on. But in any case, Dyer's Island off Melville uh, was given to William Dyer at that point. William Dyer and his wife had a much longer career. Uh, uh, his wife was a very close friend of Anne Hutchinson, and because of her proselytizing, I guess is the right word, uh, ultimately she was uh, executed in Boston because she was recruiting for Quakers in uh, Boston. So what they did, the settlement came. How did they come? They came mostly by ship, uh, and they sailed around Cape Cod, there wasn't a canal then, and they uh, sailed into this area. They came into this northern part of the island by the town pond. The town pond, and all I'm gonna talk about mostly is the area of the Roger Williams Conference Center, okay, up at on Route 24 there. The town pond is a body of water that goes out into the bay. It has a fairly narrow opening, but that's how the ships came in, into the town pond. So they unloaded there, and this is March now, about March 25th, 26th, around that period, and they start to build shelters. Uh, some of the shelters were, were lean-tos, some of them were holes dug in the ground and covered over. And as time went on, they decided they would start building houses. Many of you, probably most of you, have been to Plymouth. Okay, Plymouth, you can see a good idea there of the kind of structures that, that initially were built. Everyone in the community was given, everyone in the, the group, was given a two-acre house lot. And those house lots mostly were around that area at the northern end of town. They also set up, set up a, and created a common fence point 
where they could have their sheep graze uh, intermingled. Of course, they all had um, earmarks, and there's a, a collection of town records of Portsmouth that show what everybody's earmark was, and, but they fenced it off so that they could have their sheep graze out there. Eventually, over a very short period of time, they were given other farms, farms to the south of the original settlement. Some of those farms were as far down as Sandy Point Avenue and as far down as, uh, as almost Melville. But in those cases, a lot of those farms were as much as 200 acres. Most of these people were farmers, at least for the most part. Some were merchants, like Coddington and a few others, and they, uh, they had their farms as well. The story of what happened next, you'll have to come to my lecture on Wednesday night at the library to find out more, especially up to the point of the split, where some of the people decided under Coddington's leadership that they were going to go to Newport, go to settle in Newport. And the main reason they went there was because it was a better harbor. But there were other reasons. There were economic reasons. There were also civil reasons because the Coddington followers did not get along with the what were called the Hutchesonians. Okay. More, I'll give you more detail on that. But again, what's really important about this document that we have beside us here is first of all that it's 378 years old. And second, you can read the signatures. As far as I'm concerned, the signatures are the best part because these are people, again, who founded not only Portsmouth but, but Newport as well. They, they left, the settlers who went to Newport uh, went there in 1639, just a year after they had come here. And uh, it, it's just a very special document for our history. There aren't too many towns around that have a founding document like this that was written that long ago that's still in existence. The compact itself, well, I, I'll tell you a little bit of a further story. There the, one of the concepts that they had evolved right away was the idea of town meetings. Town meetings and all the um, representatives of, in the town, all the free men in the town, would gather once a year, create the budget, determine how they were going to defend themselves. They had all kinds of uh, possibilities that they feared, not only from the Indians, who, by the way, had agreed to leave the island in the first winter, uh, but they also were worried about Massachusetts. What we might not realize is that, that Little Compton, Tiverton, Barrington, all the way up to Cumberland was part of Massachusetts Bay and was part of Massachusetts as a colony and a state into the, well, no, a colony, I'm sorry, into the 1740s, 1750s. So they feared Massachusetts. They feared Governor John Winthrop, the governor of Massachusetts, who had been the primary person who uh, made sure that Anne Hutchinson didn't survive in Massachusetts Bay. So they, they were concerned about being too close to Massachusetts, that they might be absorbed sometime. So they had, and we have in the area, most of you I hope have found it now because we did put up a big sign in the 375th, Founders Brook. And Founders Brook is down right off Route 24, okay, and again in the vicinity of the Roger Williams Conference Center, we used to say the Ramada Inn, uh, but, uh, and there's a big sign there that leads you to Founders Brook which makes it look like you're going into somebody's backyard. It's a very special place though. There's parking there and you if you haven't been there, you should go. There's parking areas and there are memorial stones. Memorial stones, the, the town compact itself is on a piece of pudding stone there. It's been there since 1936 when it was, uh, when the state of Rhode Island was celebrating its 300th anniversary and there were memorial services and things like that there. There also are several monuments to Anne Hutchinson there. And there's a, a um, a garden, a beautiful babbling brook that goes through, and it's really a special place. It's a place where you can really go sit quietly, read a book, whatever. It's, it's really a great place to go. So find it if you haven't found it yet. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's right off, uh, off Boyd's Lane down there at the bottom of the hill. So what happened next? Again, I'm going to talk about all of that uh, Wednesday night. If you want to come to that lecture, by the way, you need to sign up with the library. Uh, and as of Saturday, they had 40 of the 50 slots filled. So what we did in the 375th, we may have to do it again this time. 
we uh, may have to give the lecture twice. I have no problem with that. It's a PowerPoint lecture that I'll be uh, showing you a lot of this stuff. And we'll go over some of this same stuff, but in quite more extensively. So enjoy seeing the compact. It's a very special document for us. It's a very important part of Portsmouth's history. And I hope that, uh, that you get as much of a thrill out of seeing it as I do. Should we have questions or no? Yeah, you take Quick questions. Thank you. I'll take a few quick questions if you have them. Yep. When Ben Hudson was charged, then, was her husband also charged? No, she was, but she had, at that time, she had 12 children, I think it was, and so the family kind of had to stay together. What they did with her, this is really interesting, what they did with her is that they made her go to a, a, a house five mile, four miles away from her own house for that winter of 37, 38. She couldn't be with her family. But yeah, they obviously he was she was leaving, so he was leaving. Mm -hmm. Well, what, the reason I ask you is if she was not allowed to sign or have legal representation, why was her husband not charged? Should he have had control of his wife? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll touch that one. It wasn't any different then than it is now. No comment. Uh, no, it, it, she was a very independent-minded person. She was really, uh, she said what she thought. And she said, you ministers are doing this all wrong. And again, her husband, her husband was a rather reserved person who really didn't get, uh, get involved in all of this much. Um, even when he came here, eventually he became the, uh, uh, the, uh, the leader of the Portsmouth settlement after Coddington and his friends left. And, uh, you know, it just, it, it, he didn't last very long. He died soon, soon after that. He died in 1641. So he was, he was only here three years. But I think it was a matter of just, uh, you know, going to the flow, I guess is the right word. But they, they were, uh, he was not charged. It was strictly her. It probably would have watered down the charge if he had been charged as well. But he never participated, as far as we know, never participated in these discussions that she was having uh, in her home. And uh, at first it was women, then it was just anybody who wanted to come. And it must have been, it was a big house. Uh, it was right in the middle of Boston. Boston looked a little different then. It was one narrow peninsula that went out, the Shawmut Peninsula. They had a lot of, you know, the Back Bay, and that's all fill in Boston. So they were out, out on the edge of it. And uh, Will Hutchinson had an island out in the bay where he was able to graze his sheep and things like that, too. It's a good question, though. Yes. Okay, it was an original document by itself, but it was incorporated into the town records. And what happened with the town records is that at that meeting where the people going to Newport separated, uh, they were in a town meeting, and William Dyer was the clerk, the secretary. And what he did at one point was to close that book, they walked out of the town meeting and left. And the compact went with it. That book was further used for the town records of Newport, the town meeting records of Newport. So it kind of went off to Newport, and uh, thus uh, it, it's stored with the archives of Newport in uh, in the state archives. I think, right, Tracy? Right. Any other qu questions? Yes. There, there are no known graves, as far as anybody knows. There has been archaeology done out in the area of the, uh, you know, the gravel pit out there and the ponds behind it. They, they excavate those ponds a lot and put a lot of fill in there uh, also for people to go out and fish and so on. But in uh, 19, I'd say it's about 1978 or so, archaeology was done out there and a lot of stuff was found. Uh, a fellow by the name of Marley Brown who was at Brown University did the archaeology. Eventually he turned over a lot of the stuff they found to uh, John Pierce. And when John Pierce died a few years ago, he donated his collection to the library. A lot of those archives are in the library in a glass case. S uh, pipe stems and pipes and things like that, they're there. So go take a look at there too. We, we with the historical society are trying to work out a really close relationship with the library and, and they're open all the time. We're not, and, but we're gonna be more, uh, more open than we are now. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do with the historical society is to get handicapped access, both to the museum on the basement floor and the meeting room on the upper floor. And we're working on that. 
It's going to be a big grant. But uh, because we think that that room that seats about 220 people is very much underutilized, and, and we want to pe have people you know, use it to have meetings and things like that. But yeah, so that archaeological stuff is in the library, a lot of it. And some of the locations are there. I, I should mention a book. There's a book called uh, American Jezebel. And it's about Anne Hutchinson. It's written by a woman by the name of Eve LaPlante. She came down to lecture during our 375th that we had. She's up in Boston. And uh, uh, she, she's done a lot of research on it. Her book is more about her trials than it is about settling in Portsmouth. But there is stuff in Portsmouth. And I, I contributed to that. I helped her write part of that, the, the Portsmouth part. But uh, anyway, yes, back in the back, Bill. Do you know some of the issues that she disagrees with the clergy on? Yeah, it ha it's very. I don't have time to get into it right now, but essentially what it is, it was called the antinomian crisis. And it's a matter of whether you can recognize a person who has been saved, who has been saved by the works that they do. It's, it's faith and good works is really what the thing is. And, and what she said was that you cannot. A person is destined to be saved from birth. And you can't use an example, someone who does good work as therefore becoming saved. It's, it's a you know, scriptural crisis like that that went back and forth. And she just denied what the ministers were saying about it. And she had her own ideas. Very powerful woman, very important woman. Also, one of the things you need to know, also, I'll just conclude with this because we're going to run out of time here. But, and everybody wants to see the compact who hasn't seen it. But also, there's, there are two things that are important about the Portsmouth Settlement. First of all, the concept of the town meeting. And the town meeting was, again, free men, not everybody, free men in the, the first town meeting. I think there were nine or ten people that were there. Well, we had a town meeting in Portsmouth, some of you remember, until about, what, 1980. 85, something like that. Became kind of a disaster after a while. But, uh, but we, uh, we had a town meeting, and that, again, an exercise in democracy, which is really good. Another thing that's really important is that John Clark was a strong believer in religious freedom. And religious freedom wasn't really practiced that much here because they, these early colonists did not s set up a church here. But when John Clark went to Newport, and if you stand at the spring area there behind the, the, uh, the, the federal buildings, which is under review for, for change, we hope, for a nice, uh, established, nice park there, you look around and you see a Baptist church, you see a Jewish uh, synagogue, you see, you know, within the area, you see a whole bunch of different churches. John Clark became the minister of the, of the uh, Baptist church, the first Baptist church in Newport. And so, again, the extensive religious availability. Ironically, by the 1650s and 60s, the, the, I think the percentage is something like 65% of the population of Rhode Island were Quakers. Quakers really came on strong. George Fox came to visit here. And our friend's meeting house across the street was built in 1701. Yeah, 1701. The Newport one in 1699. So Quakers were really big around here, too. Anyway, thank you very much. By all means, I think that's the end of the service. Come take a look at the compact. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Just we've just in the middle of our first annual Founders Day. Yep. So, and what do you think? How do you think it's going so far? I think it went very well. I think we had a really full house, and, and people seem really interested. Even people have been here before and seen it before. But uh, yeah, I think it went really well. Do you think that uh, if we're successful in making the renovations we want down to the main building, at some point we'd be able to convince the state to host the, this uh, display on our Founders Day down at our uh, former church building? Or sure, why not? The state has a preservation. Uh, the Historic Preservation Commission has a meeting every year in a different town. We did it in 1980 sometime at the Manor House. But, uh, and it, this year it's in North Kingstown, South North Kingstown. And I'm giving a tour over there for part of that. So, but it's, uh, yeah, sure, we could do that. So, so maybe we could take that on as a project to 
get the state to hold their meeting down here and then in conjunction with that have our Founders Day event. Yeah. As opposed to, I mean, it's perfectly fine here at Town Hall. Yeah. But it would be a lot nicer to have it down there. We get a lot more audience. Sure. No, that would be great. Yeah, why not? Well, good. Well, thanks a lot. Okay. Okay. I just, I'd like to ask you how you thought our first annual Founders Day went and uh, say a few words for Mr. Sure, Kulitsky. sure. I'd be happy to. Um, I, I think this whole thing from start to finish has been a, a dynamite activity. You know, it started uh, in 2013 with that uh, wonderful year-long celebration, and this is just a natural outgrowth of, uh, of that outpouring of community spirit, acknowledgement of our history. I think this is terrific, and my hats are off to uh, my hats off to all of you that uh, that got this rolling. And I hope uh, I hope that new life in the historical society continues and grows. So thank you. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Thank you for your comments. Yeah. We're, we're hopeful that uh, this will uh, make a little bit of a splash and we'll repeat again next year. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What a great turnout. Absolutely. Yeah, terrific. In the Navy and we've lived all over the world. I, I see. Well, um, we're very grateful that you guys were able to come. This is uh, our first. We're Founders excited. Day, so, you know, it's, it's good that you've got uh, kind of a new precedent. A got very, in on the ground floor. A very high bar. It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm working with uh, Tracy Croce. She's our archivist. She brought the uh, uh, compact document down from Providence this morning for us to view, and she'll take it back. Just like to, uh, this is your second trip down, so uh, what do you think about all of this? Are we, and, and how do, do other communities have um, an opportunity to display documents? Uh, we, we don't do it a lot. Um, you, you've been the first town that has... Uh, requested this document, but um, I'm amazed at how many people really want to see the document. It's just terrific, isn't it? Yeah, they do. They, they like seeing the original, and I think, I think it's nice that people have a, an interest in the history of their community. So. And uh, just uh, for the purpose of uh, kind of a, anybody that's listening to this, what, what are the rules here? You have to uh, keep your eyes on a document or be in the same room with it? Be in the, the same room with it, yes, because it's it, it remains in the custody of the state archives. Under your control. Under my control right today. <laughs> so um, maybe if uh, the Portsmouth Historical Society is as successful as we hope in converting our growth in membership to uh, re, uh, rehabbing our building and making it uh, completely environmentally sound, what are the chances the state would consider? with the police escort, et cetera, uh, bringing the document down to the museum site itself? Uh, I could uh, find out, find that out. I, I don't have the authority, so uh, the state archivist uh, and the secretary of state would have a uh, 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 input on that. All right, well, that's good. It's good to know. I mean, we're, we're hopeful that in the next couple of years we'll convert uh, this, uh, the upstairs in our building down there to a 200-person multifunction center. And certainly the interest in the document is so great that I think it would, if we had it down there, it would bring even more members of our community out to see your document. Sure, sure. Well, we'll follow up. Touch. All yes. right, well, well, thank you very much. You're again. welcome. Okay. Okay. We're here with uh, Dave Gleason, um, council member and also a board member of the Portsmouth Historical Society. So. What did you think of the event, Dave? Um, well, you know, this is my second time here. Obviously, I was here for the 375th, and it's, and it's just as exciting to see it again. Um, you know, there's a family member on my wife's side, John Cogshell, signed this document, what, 378 years ago, and just unbelievable to think of. So it's, it's, I'm glad that they brought it back here again. Well, I, um, I'm just here with uh, one of the Newport uh, colonial... Uh, Artillery? Yeah, what, Newport what's a, Company of Artillery, sir. Newport Company of Artillery. Uh, Dean Holt from Tiverton, and he's been here providing a, a very appropriate color guard for the town compact document. And it turns out that uh, apparently uh, you're descended from one of the signers, the signatories. Yes, the sir. Uh -huh. who, who would that be? Uh, I'm uh, related to William Aspinwall. Aspinwall. Uh, have you I been able to find his signature on a document? I have. Uh, he had really an elegant signature, and uh, um, so I'm very proud to be associated with the Portsmouth Compact. Great. 
That's just great. Well, thank you again for, for being here and for being a part of it with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I'm, I'm here with Joanne Moyer. She's our town clerk. She helps make all this happen. And I just wanted to ask her how she thought today's event went. And um, hopefully, whether or not we hope you're looking forward to this next year. Absolutely. I think this was a tremendous day. It's a shame that the council chambers wasn't larger because I think with a little bit, we could have a, a lot. <laughs> a lot of the town here um, we sh it's an exceptional day for t the town and for the historic society well we agree we agree and thank you again thanks for Anytime. for being a big help for us here okay Anything, well that's what we're here for we're here to help the people <laughs> all right well thank you very much thank you gary bye bye, -bye.